this is the third year in a row that this international telecom provider has joined us at the conference. Please welcome Steve Jack now, the Deputy Director of Channel Business Development at China Telecom Americas, as he shares his insightful keynote on the major markets and solutions for Canada MNC's China business. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I'm excited to be here at the Canadian Channel Partners Conference and working with the Zio team. A lot of great information over the last couple of days, so we'll get we'll get right into it. So, what I'm going to be talking about today is the key markets and solutions for Canada's multinational corporations that are doing China business. This will give you some insight into some of the challenges of doing business in China, as well as some of the solutions that are critical to going ahead and making sure that applications work for enterprise customers and others that need to do international connectivity. So let's go ahead and get started. So today's agenda will overview the business activity in China, show the relevance of why it's an important topic. The key market segments for China business, this gives you an idea to the different verticals that exist there that are strong in relation to China business activity. Uh, some of the key factors and regulation, regulations that exist, things that need you need to be aware of to help customers in order to do business in China. Uh, also, really diving into the specific network solutions, the key factors that you have in regards to building those network solutions and the best practices for those network solutions. So afterwards, after I'm done, there'll actually be an opportunity to hear from Brandy Tolbert, and she'll be doing an overview of our company itself. So let's take a look at China business in whole, as a whole. So first of all, certainly everyone's aware it is a large economy. It is actually the second largest economy in the world to the United States. Uh, the numbers there are from 2019. I just saw some numbers today that were showing that China was one of the few com uh, countries that actually grew in 2020, 2.3%. They're now at about 15.5 trillion US dollars in terms of their gross national product. They're also the largest exporter and second largest importer of goods. And of course, we all know about some of the, the capabilities they have in relation to uh, exporting, and they do have high demand for imports. Major sectors are that certainly um, that we have experienced are manufacturing, retail, uh, energy, uh, the banking area and financial services, additional areas like electronics and computer software and internet. Um, health and health related biotech is very big now also. So in 2018, the growth mainly came from consumption. So what does that mean to us? Well, there are certainly a high demand for goods and services, and that would mean that a lot of companies are trying to leverage China as a business market. Part of that growth has come from the middle class. The middle class has expendable income. They're the ones buying these parts, services, and being able to drive some of the economic growth and activity. Why is China a, good, a market that has seen growth? Well, there's quite a bit of high productivity. The labor costs are indeed low. And overall, the relatively good infrastructure makes it so that they can be a leader in things like manufacturing for the world. It is the world's largest e-commerce market. Um, you can see that in 2018, they had 40 trillion yuan, which is a sizable number of something like eight and a half um, trillion US dollars. And mobile payments is, is something that they started on quite a lot before many other areas of the world. And even now, there are organizations that are getting into mobile payment that they're bringing in from outside of China to enable that continued growth. So let's discuss a little bit about the key market segments for China business in more detail. First of all, financial services. You may know that China has some of the largest stock exchanges in the world. Uh, in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Shenzhen are the big financial markets. And that drives a lot of business activity relative to financial services. They also do a major amount of manufacturing. They lead the world in output with over 2.5 one zero one trillion in, in output for manufacturing 
you may not realize quite as much the retail is that big in China, but due to that large spending increase of the Chinese consumer and the middle class with their expendable income, they've seen a dramatic growth in retail sales and they grow 9% on average annually in the past five years. The brands that are available there are both foreign and domestic. The Western brands actually have quite a bit of popularity. So consumers are trying to make sure they can get access to that in an effective way. But there's a lot of cross-border type of consumer activity. And also, at least in pre-pandemic times, there was a lot of individual store sales. In the energy markets, they're quickly moving to renewable sources and generation of those renewable sources. However, they still use an extensive amount of coal and they import coal. Uh, they're also moving quite quickly into things like electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, and building their own brands as well as welcoming brands like Tesla. I mentioned biotech, but healthcare itself is, it is the second largest healthcare market and it's the fastest growing market among the top five globally. Uh, and as we move forward, that element is going to become even more important in relation to things like a pandemic or other world events that cause concern in healthcare. So with that large middle class and with their internet connectivity, along comes the game. So everybody uses the internet for gaming. I think our, our kids have grown up doing that, right? So uh, and many adults, but there is a strong adoption of social media and gaming throughout China. Uh, some of those brand names that you see there are both Chinese and non-Chinese brands but it is something that continues to drive internet connectivity and bandwidth. So if you have business in China, um, those, those multinational corporations, they are seeking ways to effectively communicate to their customers, their partners, their suppliers, manufacturers, and distributors, uh, in addition to the company-owned sites and activity that they have in the country. So let's talk about some additional key factors for China business things that are pretty important to be aware of. First of all, customer must understand how to do business in China, and that relies heavily on the policies surrounding international joint ventures. Uh, there has to be approvals and authorization to, to start a company, and it has to be Chinese majority owned. A company might go into China and start doing business there without realizing that not every network application and content is available within China. So they have to figure out ways to do business in a new environment with authorized solutions to access that content or change how they're doing it. There are strong data localization requirements for consumer data for you know, the actual Chinese consumer name, information about them has to be localized within the country. One of the things that customers don't realize as they start to do business in China is that there are higher costs for network services. What may be very inexpensive in Canada or the United States can oftentimes cost a lot more than what is expected. So uh, setting the appropriate expectations and budgeting is, is extremely important. There is a governing authority responsible for internet and other services, and that's called MIT. So I want you to introduce that because that's a key element of how a network solution is developed later and some rules they have. Communication service requirements. So be prepared. Uh, there are Chinese language requirements for being able to provide information about who is the contact at a site. The local resources have to be Chinese employees. The maintenance support uh, is a little bit different in relation to how maintenance is done in China. Uh, the MSAs and SLAs that you get are different and you, you may not always be able to do them under US or Canada law, which may be an issue for that company. How you get billed, if you're expecting to get it in Canadian currency, uh, you may be dealing with the Yuan or the RMB, which is the Chinese currency. And just realize that installation intervals and project management requirements can be different from your expectations. So it's always good to ask the questions and investigate. So let's talk about these China and international networks. So there are definitely challenges in the virtual environments. Everyone's moving to virtual environments. Everyone's using the cloud. They're using applications as a service providers. However, in China, there are specific rules around 
how, what you can do within a data center, what type of services you can bring into a data center. There are cloud regions in China that are entirely separate from other regions in the world. So if you're set up at AWS in a domain outside of China, and expect to use it effectively um, and be able to connect the domain you've set up in China. It's very critical that you understand that that's not going to be something that is easily done without some additional activity to make sure that you have an authorized solution. And I mentioned some of the privacy laws that are in, in play in China. Uh, the biggest thing I see as a factor is don't make expectations that aren't appropriate. Uh, doing business outside of China is not the same as doing, doing business in China. Realize that you need to spend a little more time. If you're guiding your customer, point out some of these particular points and make sure the customers realize that they have to explore them in order to develop the solutions that work for them. Um, so I mentioned the MIIT. So their role is internet services that deliver, uh, internet ports that deliver web hosting. These ports, and what I'm talking about is the transmission control protocol of the internet protocol. It's basically those ports are blocked. You have to file something called an internet content provider ICP ban to allow non-commercial website use and commercial website use and use a registered number to proceed. So data centers, everybody's going to be using data centers. And I mentioned some of the restrictions involved with virtual environments in data centers, but make sure that you understand the different tiers of data centers that are involved with China. China uses a five-star system for the most part. However, our Uptime Institute that governs data center tiers in other parts of the world uses a tier one through tier four with four being the highest. You have to compare and contrast what capabilities each one of these has in reference to uptime and security elements and support. And just getting equipment in and out of China it may not be the same as other countries in the world. We've, we've heard stories about experiences of customs delays or additional expenses that are incurred that are beyond the norm in relation to equipment procurement. So going equipment procurement and getting it within country is probably the best approach. So equipment support in addition, uh, mostly five by eight by next business day. So if you have 24 by seven, uh, by 365, try to set appropriate expectations as you have equipment support in China. Also voice has been heavy, heavily regulated. So, it, and it's restricted by the local telephone company, very limited VoIP in China and SIP solutions available. Uh, so please be aware that if you have a solution that uses that outside China, again, investigate whether it's possible in China first before deciding. So the reason I talk about some of the complexity of China is there are 31 provinces that can deliver some semi-independent communication services. And going about delivering separate MSAs, contracts, and dealing with customer account teams locally can be difficult. The internet provider can provide different local ar product architectures. So you may have a separate name for each of these different types of direct internet access or local access and each one could come up with a different name and it's very hard to compare apples to apples in that regard. So another mistake I see an important factor is that companies rely solely on internet-based connections to access their applications or provide services. And so they do that with you know, doing an SD-WAN that they build themselves uh, using encrypted or IPsec tunnels through the international gateways of China. Uh, and that can have a problem in, in various ways. So the recommendation is use MPLS, uh, IPVPN, or IEPL, which is Ethernet Private Line. One of the factors about those international gateways is there's variable performance congestion depending on political or social cultural events and, and the business activity that goes on through those gateways. And it really does affect a company's ability to execute their applications and serve their customers suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, et cetera. So, and, you know, maybe in Canada or the United States, you can, you know, get the best or the cheapest price of internet that you can at any particular location and then expect that the connectivity between them has worked just fine. Well, it's, we're quite aware of the fact that between different ISPs in China, there's significant bottlenecks 
that can occur with extensive round trip delay. So that may affect application performance. Also, BGP is a networking protocol that's used with internet connections for multi for multi-homing, for being able to, uh, for a customer that has their own address space, and, and that's very highly restricted. And the denial of service attacks are quite common, so everybody needs a mitigation strategy or service in order to proceed, or their company business could be at risk from attack. So let's talk quickly about some best practices. So again, compare Apple to Apples, and, and as best as possible, connect an enterprise company's network for internet services to the highest level backbone possible, because that will allow the most consistent performance without additional points of aggregation or additional points of failure. Use authorized providers. Uh, there are a set of authorized providers for encrypted tunnels and private networks. And if a company wants to mitigate their risk in relation to doing business in China, use authorized providers for these, these type of services. Also, diversity is key. So leverage providers that have diverse solutions, uh, either through their, their subsea fiber optic transport networks or through solutions like IPVPN using MPLS or Ethernet private lines. And try to get SLAs as much as possible to handle the different critical applications that a company is running. Related to SD-WAN, quite popular rollout everywhere in the world and oftentimes very simply done with cheap internet or multiple types of internet at a site. But in China, plan for a hybrid WAN approach. Uh, try to implement services that integrate both MPLS and Ethernet private lines. And also, when you're deploying the corporate VPNs, whether those are the SD-WAN type or any type of IP VPN, MPLS, make sure to build those connections so that they are all the way from the China locations to the specific destinations that are required. This will ensure better performance for those applications and it will also be a more high performing robust solution in the long term. So let's lay out a few more best practices. Okay, use that one provider backbone to avoid bottlenecks. I mentioned the BGP special operators license. So higher pricing for those connections that include BGP. Also three months of time to get this approved. So plan that into the project. Really important to have that mitigation strategy for anti-DDoS. A uh, customer might think they're, they're able to use just a firewall or even a web secure gateway to protect themselves. However, each one of these different types of security features does a different job and there's no replacing the ability to have an effective anti-DDoS response. The cloud strategy a customer uses, make sure it can officially and legally connect the international cloud locations um, in a flexible way. Try to get connections that are as last, elastic as possible with flexibility to reach a number of different locations as your needs change in the international environment. And most importantly, Choose the providers that have a strong relationship and business volume. Um, they're dealing with the local service providers in China uh, with those local operating companies. And having experience there is very important and can really speed up the implementation of services. It's also important to have both the local and global project management teams, the ones here that can effectively work with you and the ones there that will do the business on the ground in China. So I think hopefully I've given you a little insight in doing business in China, being able to deliver international connectivity solutions, and some of the key problems that we've seen customers come across. So at this point, I'd just like to offer up additional guidance that I can provide you. I am Steve Jack now at ctamericas.com. So feel free to reach out to me, or you can reach me via our channel, which is channel team at ctamericas.com. And at this point, I will turn it over for Brandy Tolbert, who is our channel business development manager, to do a, a summary of our corporation, China Telecom Americas. Thank you very much today.